Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody make sure they have their electronic devices switched off or at least on silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the committee? Um, agenda item one invites me um, to put to the committee that we take agenda item three in private. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Um, let me move us to item two, and the committee will now take oral evidence on the Auditor General's reports on the 2015-16 audit of Edinburgh College, the 2015-16 audit of Lewes Castle College, and the 2015-16 audit of Murray College. Um, we were scheduled to take this business at last week's meeting, but unfortunately ran out of time, so I do apologise to all the witnesses if there was any inconvenience caused to them, um, and thank you for rescheduling your diaries to be here today. Um, I welcome Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Hugh Harvey, partner at KPMG, Michael Lavender, Audit Manager at Scott Moncrief, um, and Darshi Santa Kumaran, Mark McPherson, and Anne MacDonald, all from Audit Scotland. Um, the Auditor General's opening statement will cover all three reports, and can I invite the Auditor General to address the meeting? Thank you, convener. As you say, I'm presenting three reports on colleges this morning, uh, which accounts for the number of witnesses you have before you to help us answer your questions as thoroughly as we can. Um, they all raise matters of public interest arising out of the audits of the college's financial statements, and I've prepared the reports under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act, which is the vehicle for me to bring those matters to your attention here in Parliament. The external auditors gave unqualified audit opinions on the 2015-16 accounts of all three colleges, but they also highlighted concerns about financial sustainability at each of them. I'll begin with Edinburgh College. As the committee knows, this is the second report I've prepared on Edinburgh College's financial position. In my last report, I highlighted issues arising from the college's failure to meet its student activity target and concluded that the college would face significant difficulties without further financial support. Since then, the committee has taken evidence from both the college and its auditors. The auditor, KPMG, highlighted that the college continued to face significant financial challenges. The college reported a deficit of £7 million for 2015-16 and relied on additional financial support from the Scottish Funding Council in order to meet its liabilities. As I reported last year, a review by the principal found that the college had long-standing problems with its curriculum and with recruiting and retaining students. Audit work undertaken since then has confirmed that these issues had not been properly addressed in the, years, in the years before merger, partly due to a lack of leadership on the curriculum and partly due to a lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities. The College now has a good understanding of the issues that have led to its current financial position and it's making good progress with its transformation plan, including a review of the curriculum. It's also put in place stronger governance arrangements. The College is confident that it will meet its 2016-17 activity targets, and this programme is welcome. But the College continues to face significant financial challenges, and its future sustainability depends on successful implementation of the remainder of the transformation plan. The College also needs to make substantial savings through voluntary severance. Although the Funding Council has provided assurance that it will continue to support the College, this is contingent on the College continuing to implement the transformation plan, and any unexpected changes in its costs or its income could lead the College to needing further financial support. Moving on to Lewes Castle College, the Auditor Scott Moncrief highlighted concerns about financial sustainability as a result of the College not achieving student activity targets. He also highlighted that delays in appointing board members had a significant impact on governance. While the college isn't in immediate financial difficulty, it has missed its targets over an extended period, and the margin by which it missed the target in 2015-16 was significantly higher than in previous years. In multi-college regions, the Funding Council provides funding to the regional body, in this case the University of the Highlands and Islands. The regional body is then responsible for agreeing activity levels and allocating funding to the colleges in the region. Because the region overall exceeded its target, the Funding Council didn't seek recovery of funding from the University of the Highlands and Islands, and UHI didn't seek any recovery from the College. There is a risk, though, that continu continued under-delivery could result in both a reduction in future funding and a recovery of funding for past activity that wasn't delivered. Any reduction or recovery of that type would have a detrimental effect on the College's financial sustainability. 
The College Board and Committees considered performance regularly, but there's little evidence of the Board taking effective action to address these risks. The College developed new marketing, employer engagement and curriculum strategies from 2014, but these haven't delivered the intended increases in student numbers. The College is still working with UHI to agree a revised activity target and to adjust its cost base to match this. Finally, Murray College. During the year, Murray College needed urgently to draw down an advance of £697,000 on its funding allocation from UHI, the regional body in this case as well, as it didn't have enough money to meet its operating costs. This was the second year in which the college needed to request an advance of funding. In January 2016, the college was forecasting an NGS surplus of £145,000, but by April this had changed to a forecast deficit of £499,000. The auditor from Audit Scotland found that the management accounts analysed the areas of overspend but didn't provide explanations for variances between budgets and forecasts. And further problems arose when the budgets and the cash flow forecasts weren't updated to reflect new information. The College's current financial position isn't sustainable and it's currently discussing a recovery plan with both UHI and the Funding Council based on reaching financial balance by 2019. It's important that UHI ensures the College can deliver on its priorities within the resources available to it, and the College Board will obviously also have an important role to play in monitoring the College's progress with the agreed recovery plan. All three Colleges face different challenges, but all need to take action now to get onto a firmer financial footing. As always, Convener, my colleagues and I will do, do our best to answer your <coughs> questions. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder whether I might start off, and I think we'll take each of the colleges in turn, starting with Edinburgh. Um, uh, can you confirm, Auditor General, that this report on Edinburgh builds on the issues that were in your previous report? Because uh, I'm keen to establish if there is anything new that, that is arising in this current report. Absolutely, convenient. Yes, it does build on my previous report and the evidence sessions which were held with the college um, representatives by this committee um, previous to my report being published. I think the key, um, two key differences that are worth highlighting are, first of all, an update on the financial position and the progress with the recovery plan for 2015-16, and secondly, a bit more detail about the principal's investigation of the underlying causes of the problems. Um, committee members who were in place when I reported last year will recall that the issues had come to light very shortly before the deadline for Section 22 reports being laid in Parliament. So we've taken the opportunity since then to do some more work to investigate the underlying causes and you'll find that in my report. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, <clears throat> A significant uh, issue in this is that everybody who was apparently involved in this has gone and there's really nobody to point the finger at now. However, I'd be interested to explore a little bit more about the role of the board. In your report on page 9, uh, paragraph 28, you, s you say that board members told you that during 2013-14, it became clear there were financial problems at the college, but the root cause wasn't clear from the information that was provided to the board. So what did the board do about it? Um, I'll ask you to come in in a moment, um, but my understanding, and I hope it's reflected in the report, is that because of the um, lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities between the two people responsible for the curriculum, the information that was reaching the board wasn't adequate to enable them to, to follow up, to pursue the questions that came through. So again, but, the question is, what did the board do? They have a responsibility. Hugh, would you like to pick that up in some detail? Yes, as I, as I understand things, in, towards the end of 2013, 2012-13, uh, uh, the board were considering the budget for 2013-14, and at that stage uh, there was a budgeted deficit um, of around 1.7 million, um, and that was as a result of uh, anticipated reductions in SFC funding um, and also post-merger pay awards that were made. Um, my understanding of those arrangements were to align the, uh, the pay awards across the former three colleges. Can I just ask um, on those so, pay awards? Yes. Surely they would not have budgeted to go into deficit to make these, these awards? There, but they would have agreed to some sort of funding with SFC? I'm not sure whether there would have been anything agreed with SFC, but... As I say, I am aware that there was a budgeted deficit for 2013-14. And you think that a large part of that were the were the uh, awards? That that was an element of it. 
Yes, that was an element. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the exact details. I'm that. just concerned that it would be extraordinary if the college was budgeting for a deficit without having made some arrangements to cover that deficit, either by agreement with the SFC or from their own reserves or whatever. Yes, uh, there were uh, the, the cash reserves um, in the college at that time. Um, they were able to support that deficit. Okay. Back to the board. Yes. Did the, what, what did the board actually do? They became clear there were problems. They became clear there was a deficit. What action did the board take? They have a responsibility. Yes. At, um, at that time, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, I don't mean to avoid the question, but I wasn't the auditor signing the accounts at that time. It was a predecessor of mine. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have the details of sitting you know, at the board. Apologies. In the same paragraph, Mr Beattie, in paragraph 28, to say that board minutes show that during 2014-15, the board was provided with assurances by members of the executive team that the activity targets would be met, and clearly that would have a very clear knock-on effect to the financial um, position of the college, um, and that the board itself raised the question of the need for additional management information. Um, I think the, um, the where things failed was that the lack of... Uh, clarity of roles and responsibilities in the college meant that that information still wasn't reliable enough for the board to do its business. But do you think the board was inquiring enough? Do you think that they carry out their function in terms of in interrogating the uh, the officers? The evidence from the board minutes, I think, suggests that they were carrying out their role as expected. Um, where things fell down was in the um, response they received from members of the executive team, and that rolled on through to the principal's review and the departure of key members of staff at that point. And as, as all this unfolded over a period of years, because you know quite early on the board realised there was a problem, they received assurances, presumably they received repeat assurances again and again as the situation deteriorated, what did they do? I think you'll see the story coming through um, in the report here that they asked for that information. Um, at a point in 2015, a new principal was appointed who started to dig into the underlying causes of the issues here, um, which led to which um, were based on long-standing problems with the correct curriculum, as long as as well as the lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities. Um, at that point, um, there was a restructuring of the college and eventually um, the departure in different ways of key members of the previous executive team um, and then the agreement of a recovery plan. I think the evidence we have suggests that given the long-standing nature of the problems and the lack of clarity of roles and the performance of the people carrying out those roles, the board was probably doing as much as it could have done in a difficult situation. Yep. It's worth also noting the backdrop to this was the merger um, of a number of colleges to form the new Edinburgh College and a number of other changes going on. So I think there was a lot of change for the board to get to grips with. But presumably members of the board would have headed up committees, yeah. audit committees, whatever. Would they not have been in a position to obtain more information? Or should they have been in a position to, to receive more information? Should they have been in a position to be more inquiring and ask more questions? I think our impression overall is that they were asking the questions, but the the underlying problem wasn't well understood, and the information they were getting simply didn't unpick those those questions for them well enough until a new principal was appointed in 2015 and the sequence of events described in the report took place. Um, now, clearly, there's always a matter of judgment about how far that could or should have been pushed, but the evidence from board minutes is that they were certainly asking the right questions and receiving assurances from officers about those questions. It certainly seems to me still a question over the, over the role of the board there. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so, first of all, I want to look at the... You've talked about the vice principals uh, and various responsibility about additionality. Uh, and you may recall that uh, when we had Edinburgh College in, uh, I was quite exercised about this, about <clears throat> lines of responsibility. And at the time, it would appear, uh, or uh, we were told, look, it's a general malaise. It, it's, there is no single individual. Uh, this now tends to suggest that there was a single individual. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just curious about some aspects of that. First of all, we must have known about the competency hearing into the vice principal curriculum and quality uh, at the time of the last 
uh, audit and uh, assessment. So could you comment on that at all, please? Um, in response to the convener's um, first question, I outlined the timeline of this. My report was finalised um, in February, March of 2016, um, very shortly after the problems had um, emerged in terms of the financial position that came through. Um, the evidence that you've heard since then, you've heard from the principal of the board and her colleagues, um, and I, I can't comment on um, what she told you. Um, the assurance I can give you is that since then, Darshi um, on my left here has done a lot of audit work directly in the college to look at the underlying causes and the action that's been taken since, um, and the, uh, the information that's contained on pages six and seven of the report reflects our findings there. I think it is correct that the competency hearing had probably been scheduled at that point. Um, there may be um, other factors which were affecting the principal that evidence to this committee, but in terms of the sequence of events and the underlying causes, um, we set out our full understanding of that based on the audit work that's been carried out since. But why didn't the principal tell me about the competency hearing? Because I, speci I recall specifically asking, who is responsible for this? And at the time, I seem to recall, uh, I suppose you'll say that you, you, that's that's for them to answer. Uh, I just wonder if there's there's more to be done there actually, because it feels like I asked a direct question and it was dodged at the time. And that in the light of the new information that you've got, I'm afraid I can't answer why the principal gave you the answer that she did. If I was speculating, and I'd stress it is speculating, um, I think that um, it is rarely the case in situations like this where one individual carries all of the responsibility. You'll note from the sequence of events set out on pages six and seven that the other vice principal had previously applied for and received voluntary severance. Mm -hmm. um, whether that, um, that underpins a sort of clear cut division of responsibility between the two individuals or simply the sequence of events as the uh, management structure was reviewed and decisions were taken, I don't know but we've set out our best understanding of what did happen here, and I think the principal would have to um, answer your broader question about the reasons for the, for the answers she gave to this committee. Okay. Uh, just staying on that briefly, uh, and it may be a question for Darshi, uh, what review do you know has been done on the recruitment process? Is, uh, I'm somewhat concerned about this idea of matching. Uh, th this person seems to have uh, just been given a post and then on reflection, they've discovered that this person was manifestly unsuitable uh, for that post. And, and, and secondly, <clears throat> can you tell me in terms of the process, uh, this individual resigned. Now, did they resign in response to being told you are going to be under investigation? Uh, because if so, uh, if, if you like, the record will be clean and they may have gone off to do something similar. Um, as far as the, the matching is concerned, I think the, the development plan that the interim principal put in place featured a, a restructuring of the executive team. And then at the point at which the current principal came into post in May was when that was carried out and the two vice principal posts were merged. Um, I don't have a lot of detail about the job matching process, but the, I, as I understand it, it the fit was 60% or more with the vice principal curriculum's job, and that is why he was then matched into post. Um, whether it should have been a, a, a more formal recruitment process, I, that's something I think perhaps you'd have to ask the principal. Um, I'm sorry, what was your second question? Uh, so just about, <coughs> according to the report, uh, the timeline goes that the principal uh, or the board says there is a concern with this individual uh, and shortly afterwards the individual resigns apparently with a completely clean record and I'm just wondering if the individual resigns in response to a tip-off that there's going to be some action taken or just... As a, uh, moving on. Um, as it says in the report, and as I understand it from the principal's investigation, the, the board uh, were informed that the vice principal curriculum would undergo this competency hearing. And at this point, the principal did speak to the vice principal in question. And 
following that, he resigned. I couldn't comment on the motivation for his resignation. Sure. Uh, so, uh, just moving on to looking ahead, the voluntary severance scheme. Uh, I have something of a concern about that. First of all, uh, it would appear that the first voluntary severance scheme, May to June 2016, had a cost of £1.14 million, uh, with expected savings of £1.12 million. So it appears to have cost more than the anticipated savings. Uh, is that the case, and do you feel lessons have been learned from that? The team will keep me straight, but the way it's normally reported it w is that the cost is a one-off and the savings are recurring annual savings. Um, it, you're right, it's not explicit in the report, so apologies for that, um, but normally they're, they're annual savings which recur year after year, and that's my understanding of what's happened here. I understand. Uh, and, but this scheme, that's good, the Phase 3 scheme, is uh, more challenging. Uh, it, it targets a different demographic. It tar targets the, I think, the academic staff, uh, and it's going to strip out a significant number of those people. Uh, first of all, is this going to work in terms of pure finances? But secondly, do you have any concern in that it, it rather seems to me that a college without staff? Uh, the, the product that a college sells is its expertise, its academia. Uh, You're absolutely right that having the right staff um, with the right skills and the right teaching experience are critical to the success, success of any college. Um, the uh, voluntary severance scheme for academic staff is time to follow the curriculum review element of the transformation plan. Um, the college needs to review its curriculum to make sure, first of all, that it's meeting the needs of students and employers, um, and secondly, that it can afford to, to deliver that within the activity targets and funding agreed with the funding council. Um, so the, their intention is that they will complete the curriculum review, then identify what staffing is needed um, for the future curriculum that will be in place, um, and invite voluntary severance applications to, to try and bring the two in line with each other. Um, as we say in the report, there is a risk with any voluntary severance scheme that the people who apply for voluntary severance are not necessarily the people who you would uh, most like to lose from your workforce or who would be um, who are at least critical to delivering the curriculum for the future. Um, the college obviously still has the right to refuse any individual application, but there is a risk that they won't uh, they won't receive enough suitable applications to make the savings that are intended from it, and that's the risk that we highlight in the report. Yes. So you, you, you do, and I think you're right to. It's uh, that would be my significant concern. What's the backup plan? If this doesn't happen, what what does happen? The um, there are two routes I think open to the college. Um, the first and the, the less likely is that it's able to raise significant amounts of funding from other sources to replace the income that it will likely continue to lose from the funding council as its activity targets come into line with what it's able to deliver for the future. The second and more likely is that it will, ha that it will have to negotiate with the funding council um, either changes to its targets or more transformation funding to give it more time to make the changes that are needed. But that is, as I say in the report, the significant risk to the delivery of the transformation plan and coming back into financial balance. Thank you. Okay, Monica Lennon. Thanks, Kimberly. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm looking at page 12 of your report, um, Auditor General, and I see that the college plans to make further savings um, in estate management um, across the four campuses. I'm just wondering, do you have any more information on that? Because I'd be quite interested to know what impact that might have have one students? Um, I think that the um, estates work is a part um, of the overall uh, financial sustainability element of the transformation plan, so they're taking a planned approach to it, as you would expect. Um, I think the planning work is not yet complete, but I'll ask you if there's more he can add in that area. Thank you. Uh, the planning work, as far as I understand it, is not complete. Um, the work on the what elements of the estate um, are required um, will follow the curriculum review as well. So everything falls into place behind that. Okay. So do you see any changes to the availability of, of courses, for example? It, again, it's, it's difficult to predict um, what the curriculum review uh, will throw out. Um, 
there are four campuses um, and where the courses will be delivered, again, it, it, it remains to be seen. I think there's, there's, that is the largest part of the transformation plan is getting to the bottom of that. So. Okay, so will the curriculum review inform the estate management review? Is that how it works? It sh it sh yes, it should fall into place behind that, yes. Okay. Um, on that same page, um, you know, you highlight the importance of cash flow management. Is it paragraph forty-two of page twelve, um, where you say that cash flow management is a critical component, and you highlight a number of areas, um, including the outcome from national bargaining. Um, that's clearly a live issue at the moment, um, with the biggest. Um, uh, you know, industrial action I think we've seen in education since the 1980s. Um, the financial pressures you've highlighted are kind of well rehearsed now, but is, is there any link, as you understand it, between the current um, industrial dispute over national bargaining and the financial pressures that colleges such as Edinburgh College are facing? I think what I say is that the um, national pay bargaining, which follows from reform um, and was intended to harmonise terms and conditions right across the sector, obviously affects all colleges. And it affects colleges in different ways, depending on their starting points. Um, some colleges are closer to what will finally be agreed than others are, um, and therefore will have there'll be less of a financial impact on it. You'll see in one of the reports we'll come on to later this morning that in previous years, a failure to plan for the um, impact of pay negotiations ha had an effect on their um, financial position. Um, I think it hasn't, it's not something which in the case of Edinburgh College has led to the position they're in now, but it clearly is a financial pressure that they and other colleges will need to accommodate in future once they know the final details and that all colleges should be doing some scenario planning for now to understand what it might mean for them and how they would fund that given the other pressures that are around. Um, Colin Beattie had made reference to, to the board earlier. Um, it's my understanding that, that Ian Mackay, who is the chair of the board in Edinburgh College, um, is also on the board of Collegy Scotland and is also the chair of the Employers Association in Scotland, who are you know, part of the negotiation just now with um, the EIS. Do you foresee any, any conflicts of interest there? Um, Speaking at, in response to your question directly, I can't see a particular conflict of interest. Um, on the one hand, um, in a country the size of Scotland, I think anybody with the experience and insight to be able to lead the negotiations for the employers would likely have a role um, with one of the colleges um, to have built up that experience. Um, equally, the um, negotiating team on the staff side will also have um, an interest in terms of being um, representing or being members of college staff at this point in time. I think that's not an unusual feature of any sort of industrial negotiation. Um, clearly the question is what the long-term <coughs> costs are for the sector as a whole and what it means for individual colleges given it will differ from case to case. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. Mr Convener, um, and uh, apologies if this, uh, this issue may have been covered at previous discussions of the committee, but Auditor General, I'm looking back at your report from 2013, <coughs> and if, in terms of Edinburgh College, it highlighted then that the income had dropped by about £11 million at that time, and you mention in that report that a substantial portion of income, £1.6 million, had been lost, uh, mainly through the overseas student programme that the UK Borders Agency stopped. Then shortly after that, the Funding Council issued this guidance and additionality. Is there a correlation between the college's losing income and the emergence of more of this additionality to top up courses in a, as, a, as a means to try and balance income? Um, I don't think we've got the evidence to support that as a, as a, a, a clear finding in this case. Um, I think it's certainly the case that um, one of the reasons the Funding Council wanted to um, put limits on additionality was because they felt that there was a risk it could be used by some colleges to top up financial pressures that were coming from other sources. Um, and I think one of the underlying issues in Edinburgh was that um, long-standing problems with recruiting and retaining students weren't apparent to the board um, because of the use of additionality to top up the income flows that were expected. Um, so it's possible that the um, drop in income that you highlight was a factor. Um, but I think the broader question is that the funding 
Standing Council recognised that additionality wasn't being used in the ways that were planned to broaden the coverage of further education and put measures in place to limit that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems to still be an issue, the additionality issue, and it goes through all of the reports. Uh, but you do say, and you did say at the op in your opening remarks, that the College is confident it will meet its activity targets. Does that mean that this issue of additionality is agreed now with the Funding Council and that's... Yes, at the time we finalised the report, um, both the College and the Funding Council were confident that Edinburgh College would meet its 2015-16 target overall. Um, we know the Funding Council is monitoring the use of additionality very closely, in this case particularly as you would expect, um, and that would suggest that the combination of the College getting its house in order um, and the reduction in its target from the Funding Council is helping to bring it closer to balance on the back of the plan that runs through to 2019-20. Mm -hmm. And, and just on that issue about the overseas programmes, have they in any way come back onto the table or have they been swept away and are gone and lost forever now? Do we know? Can you say anything about that? I'm, I'm not sure. Because it was a substantial annual income that the college was able to, to, to oh. call on. I'm hearing from the team that, that we don't... We don't think that is the case, um, and clearly the uncertainty that's related to Brexit may also um, be having an effect in, in this case, as it will for other colleges. OK, fine. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Neal? Can I just ask a general question? Because when you look at the three college reports, um, <coughs> there's a clear pattern of the ineffectiveness of the boards to deal with the situation, even after the board has become very much aware of the challenges in reaching targets and managing budgets and projecting surpluses and then deficits within a short period of each time with wild swings between the forecast surplus and the forecast deficit, as in the case of Lewis or, or Murray. But it's a general pattern in the public sector. I mean, the SPA evidence clearly shows that the board has not nearly been as effective as it should be. So can I ask, there are, I think there are two issues here. One is this general pattern of the boards of these public bodies not doing their job properly. Why and what do we need to do to get it sorted? And secondly, I think there's a specific issue in the college sector because to be fair to the non-executive board members in the college sector, they are unpaid other than expenses. Um, so, you know, I think you've got to take that into account, both in terms of does that affect the calibre of the people who are on these boards, does it affect the level of commitment, and does it affect the performance negatively, and should we be paying uh, the non-executive board members of colleges? Uh, and, and if we did, would that improve the effectiveness of these boards? Would we get real value for money for paying them uh, something, at least to recognise the service? So. I think, I think both of those issues, the general issue of the ineffectiveness of these boards and the very specific issue about payment to college board members and whether that's a factor in why we've got so many colleges where the boards are just not performing. I think that's a really important question, Mr Neil. I'd, I'd start off by saying um, you're right, there clearly are some boards that haven't carried out their responsibilities well in the public sector. Equally, I think we've seen some very effective boards that are mm. leading their organisations through difficult times. So I don't want to, to have a sort yeah. of blanket yeah. um, uh, condemnation of, of the way boards are working. The report on the role of boards that, the, um, that Audit Scotland published back in 2010 highlighted a number of issues about the, the variation between boards of public bodies their membership, how they're appointed, mm. um, how they operate, the expectations on them. And I think there are some important questions in there um, that would be worth a closer look, and we're certainly having a look at that ourselves as we think about our future work programme. Um, there, and one of the important things in there, I think, is the relationship between the board and its sponsoring department in government. Mm -hmm. um, some of those relationships are direct, some of them are indirect through funding bodies like the Funding Council, but the ability to, to spot problems early and tackle them seems to be very variable. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also an important question from government's perspective. Moving on specifically to further education boards, um, you're right that they are very unusual now in being unpaid. They're unusual also in that college boards appoint their own members rather than it being done through the public appointments mm. process, with in most cases ministerial approval happening. Um, before regionalisation, most of them were very small boards and small organisations, and I think that often makes it harder um, to attract um, 
strong board members with yeah. broader experience. Um, since regionalisation, um, many of them are larger, but they're still small compared to other public bodies that we see around the place. And I think it's, it's difficult to overestimate the scale of change that those boards have been through over the last three or four years, with lots of mergers happening across Scotland, the introduction of regional bodies, a change to the funding um, process and the way in which targets are set, and a significant change to government policy, which has moved funding away from part-time students and towards younger full-time students working towards a vocational course. So I think all of that has made it a very difficult environment for board members to be carrying out their roles yeah. in. And you'll also see again in later, um, the, the later two reports you're looking at this morning, the phasing of board appointments and retirements during that period has meant there's been quite a loss of the expertise that did exist. Yep. So I think, I think all of that has meant there have been particular problems in the further education sector in a context where it's always been one um, that's had uh, the, the problems that can emerge in public sector boards in, in a sort of higher volume than those problems might emerge elsewhere. But, but there's maybe a need for us to look again um, at the whole issue and how, you know, why is it some boards are very effective and other boards are very ineffective and poor performers and, you know, is there a pattern there? Is this mm -hmm. something we need to be doing in terms of general policy towards the appointment of board members and the selection? Uh, I mean, as a minister, I certainly found that some, when I, I always ask for the original list of applicants, and I often found that, that I knew people who had been turned down at the first phase. Uh, so I'm not particularly, I, I think there are aspects of the public appointments a selection process right from the beginning, which are defective, quite frankly. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I remember one case where a former Labour minister had been turned down right from day one for, a, for he was a former minister of health for a, Health board position, now, had his name come to me, although he wasn't of my party, I would have appointed him because I knew he was well and truly up to the job. Um, and yet, you know, the explanations, by the time it gets to ministers, ministers have a very limited choice, and I, I just don't think the system is working anything like as fairly or as effectively as it needs to. I think there's all... Uh, there's also a related issue of how ALEO boards are appointed by local authorities and whether they should be brought under the ambit of the public appointments code and system as well because it is wide open to corruption. Anecdotally, we hear concerns similar to the ones you've outlined um, about people not understanding why apparently qualified candidates haven't made it through the yes. process to be presented to ministers. Equally, we know from our own work that the number of applicants has been dropping over recent years, and clearly that's a concern if you're looking to attract high-quality candidates yep. and diverse board members. You want as many well-qualified people in, in a, as wide a, a way as possible to be putting their names forward in the first place. Yes. So I think it is an issue that's worthy of attention. The public appointments process, I think, is um, probably a, a bit at the edge of my remit, but the broader question of the role of boards in effective governance is at the yeah. heart of it, and we're looking at that now. Um, it would be interesting to see if the success rate of applicants from retired civil servants is markedly higher than what it is for non-civil servants. I suspect it is. That was certainly my impression. <laughs> certainly my impression. Right, I'm going to move. I'm going to move us on before we drift even further um, to consideration of Lewes Castle College. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, <coughs> so, Lewes Castle College. I have a degree of sympathy uh, for them in terms of the demographic shift and things, but it would appear that they've been missing the targets for about eight years. So, first of all, hasn't the SFC or UHI at any point stepped in in that eight years and said, hang on, there's a, there's a problem here, and if not, why not? Um, as we say in the report, they have absolutely been missing it for a number of years. The extent to which they've missed it has varied from year to year, and in the early part of that period, the Funding Council had um, a, a system whereby it would allow an element of leeway either side of the target um, in order for colleges to have a bit of flexibility in how they did it. Uh, the reason I've reported now is that the um, increases, that the uh, shortfall has increased quite markedly in the last year, and there are now real questions about financial sustainability. Uh, but I think Mark will be able to tell you a bit more about what the Funding Council has done over that period. 
I think it's worth looking at Exhibit 1 in the report, and you can see that in the early part of that period there was a significant under-delivery in 2008-9, but then some significant improvement over the subsequent years. And even in the year when I think in 2010-11, the Funding Council, although the, the, the delivery was outside of the leeway, it really equated to about two students when you added up the, the total number of hours, so didn't feel that it was right to make a clawback for, for a relatively small amount. Um, I think the real change began to happen in about 2012-13, uh, and at that point, of course, that's when regional targets applied. So the Funding Council had obviously taken the decision that since the region had achieved, it wasn't going to pursue recovery from others. But I think those last two years, 14-15, which we re reported in our uh, overview report last year, and then again this year, indicate significant uh, difficulties that haven't really been addressed in the preceding years. So is it possible then that other colleges are in this situation that haven't been picked up yet? Um, we, uh, we obviously monitor the annual reports and accounts of all of the colleges and they feed into the annual overview report that we produce. Um, there is a, a related issue in the report on Murray College that you'll be coming on to shortly. Um, and again, both of those are within the University of Highlands and Islands region and the region as a whole is meeting the target that was agreed with the Funding Council. Uh, what we aim to do is when we think this is more than just a a minor problem that can be corrected within the normal management of the organisation to bring it to this committee's attention through the Section 22 report. So at the moment, the three colleges you've got here are the ones that we have real concerns about, and, and we will continue monitoring year on year what we're seeing in individual colleges and bring that to your attention as, as necessary. Thank you. Uh, there's, it's, it's, it seems to me, it feels as though there's a basic issue of fairness going on here, insofar as Effectively, Lewes Castle has, is allowed to under-deliver because others can over-deliver, if I can put it that way. Uh, but going forward, let's say the SFC were to reduce funding. Uh, first question is, it would presumably be the UHI's overall funding package that would actually be reduced. And would there be an expectation and or could the SFC mandate that UHI specifically passed that reduction onto Lewes Castle, or would it be within the discretion of UHI to say, well, okay, we've had a reduction and we will spread that across all of our colleges? The way in which the funding model works now, um, since the reform of colleges and the introduction of the regional bodies, is that the agreement on activity targets and funding is between the funding council and the regional body. Um, so it is for the University of the Highlands and Islands to agree with the colleges that make it up um, how the funding and the activity will be distributed between them. Um, that is now the subject of a review in the region to make sure both that there is fairness between colleges and that any movements that are needed don't put individual colleges at, at immediate risk um, but clearly whenever you've got winners and losers it's a difficult position to manage um, and I think the, the um, way in which that review is taken forward will be critical to the future of both Lewes Castle and Murray Colleges. Mm. It, d does that concern you at all because presumably if the UHI were to take a decision not to not to pass it to lose but to, sh to share it mm. uh, First of all, that could mask the problems uh, at Lewes. Uh, but secondly, it gives an advantage. I, if I'm a college in a multi-college region, then I have a significant advantage over those regions where I am stand alone, don't I? I think the first thing to say, as we say in the report, is that both the college and the University of the Highlands and Islands have recognised that they were slow in understanding the implications of the new funding model that was introduced. Mm. So the review they're doing now is the review they probably wish they had done when the arrangements first came in. Um, beyond that, you're absolutely right that there is a real question of making sure not just that it's fair to colleges, but that colleges are well placed to meet the needs of students and employers in their regions. Um, and in some ways, that's particularly important in a very remote and rural area like the University of Highlands and Islands, where there may not be obvious alternatives in the way there may be in, in parts of the Central Belt, for example. Um, so the review is very important. Um, reducing activity targets has the cons consequence of reducing the funding that's available to the individual colleges in the region um, and the UHI and the Funding Council will need to be assured that those changes can be made in a way that are fair to students and to, to staff within the organisation and that the financial shifts can be made in a sustainable way. 
I think Mark's looking to add to that. Yeah, it's just to say that the review that uh, the Auditor General refers to, we, we received some information just in the past week that indicates that changes have been made to the targets for each of the individual colleges and that Lewis Castle will see a reduction in its target for 17-18. So in a sense, that they've now done the work that they've been They've now completed the work I think that they've been working on over the past little while. We haven't looked in detail at what the full implications of that are, but obviously we'll be interested in that for next year's work on the audit and both and on the overview. Mm. A, a final short question. Just uh, Carolyn Gardner mentioned uh, the uh, a misunderstanding, and you've alluded to it on page seven, uh, paragraph fourteen, about uh, a misunderstanding in the effects of changes introduced by the SFC. Now, to some extent, that's, that was the problem at Edinburgh College with the additionality. So do you extrapolate from that that there is an issue with when the SFC is making changes in its communication? Uh, and, and that actually we're ending up blaming the colleges for misunderstandings that perhaps have a root cause that's higher up the chain. It's a very good question and one we've considered, as you would imagine. Um, I think the conclusion we've drawn on the back of the work that we've done um, with the colleges and with the Funding Council is that actually the Funding Council did as much as could have been expected in terms of communicating that to the sector as a whole and to individual colleges, but against a backdrop of all of the changes I've outlined, outlined falling um, funding um, from the Funding Council to the sector, shifts in the policy for who were priority students and learners, um, regionalisation, mergers and changes to the governance overall, a number of colleges didn't fully understand the impact on them. I think that's been um, ratcheted up in the cases that we've brought to you because of particular circumstances in the college. Um, in Edinburgh, obviously, we've talked about the lack of clarity about the effect of additionality and the unclear roles and responsibilities. Um, in Murray College, I think we talk about the lack of capacity in the finance team. So those local circumstances made it worse. But I think we've concluded that it, it, the, the Funding Council wasn't um, underplaying its responsibility to communicate clearly the changes it was making. Thank you. Okay. Monica Lennon wanted to follow up, I think, on the Scottish Funding Council. Um, yeah, I mean, you've just said to uh, Liam Kerr, Auditor General, that the Scottish Funding Council did as much as it as could have been expected. Um, so I, I guess you're saying that, you know, no one in particular is, is to blame for that lack of understanding, but it just leaves me wondering if we have a sector that's overwhelmed by all of the reforms, all of the changes and, and perhaps reduced capacity. So um, is this kind of misunderstanding, is that inevitable when we have these um, programmes of, of big reform? Um, I, I don't think it's inevitable, but I do think there was a, a huge amount of change happening at one time in the FE sector mm -hmm. um, based on the post-16 Reform Act. Um, at the same time as there was a shift in government policy and a reduction in government funding. Um, so I think all of that together gave a very unusual set of circumstances. Um, colleges had a lot to deal with, the Funding Council equally had a lot to deal with at that time. And I think there may be lessons for future reform programmes about um, prioritising particular changes rather than um, the sort of big bang approach of doing it all at one time. When it becomes apparent that there is a a lack of understanding, you know, whose responsibility would that be to try and flag that up? Um, I think it will differ in different circumstances. Um, in the case of um, Lewes Castle College, um, we had the University of Highlands and Islands, which was a long, long established university in relative terms to this, taking on new responsibilities for um, overseeing and funding FE colleges. Um, and it took them some time to work it through. We had a number of very small colleges. You'll see that both Lewes Castle and um, Murray are small and had their own capacity challenges. Um, I, I, it, I know this isn't an answer that, that, that sits comfortably with the committee, but I think there's no individual responsible for it beyond the individual accountable officer responsibilities that sit up through the chain of accountability to work it through. Every accountable officer has a responsibility to make sure they've got effective controls in place to manage the public resources they're responsible for, um, and that runs through from the Funding Council to UHI and the individual college. Michael, is there anything you'd like to add in that context around the understanding of the issue from Lewes Castle and the University of the Highlands and Islands perspective? Not a great deal, to be honest. I, I, I do think, as you said, that the, the range of changes that have been going on in the sector have had an impact here. 
Um, and I think the college and UHI have flagged up that there was potentially misunderstandings that in this case they feel led to the, the activity targets being set for Lewis Castle College under the credit scheme in effect being higher than they should have been and that being the principal driver for their underachievement um, mainly in 15-16. And I think going forward, as, as Mark mentioned, there has been discussions within the regional body now that mean that going forward the Lewis Castle College credits targets will be lower now and I think seem to be more achievable. Um, although the college will have to take into account the fact that it will be a reduced income as a result of that. I think I'd just like to add that it's worth bearing in mind that the targets are meant to be agreed between the region and the SFC, and in that regard, the UHI and the colleges themselves should have an opportunity to say if they believe that the targets are not being set at the appropriate level and should continue with negotiations if they feel that is needed to get to the right figure. OK, thanks. just got one more question, convener. Um, it's the part of your report where you highlight the, the reasons for under-delivery and Lewis College, um, in attempting to give an explanation, they've pointed to the, the national policy focus on full-time courses. Now I see that Lewis College previously catered for a, a large proportion of part-time learners and older um, learners. And I don't know this part of the country terribly well, but in terms of the, the local demography, I see here that there's been a reduction in the number of young people within that catchment, and that's clearly contributed to the college's difficulty in delivering the, the target. Um, I wonder then, given what previous discussions that we've had uh, on this committee, you know, h how realistic is it that a college like Lewis College can um, you know, comply with national policy when clearly on the ground locally um, the demography in the community is, is quite different and, and what impact does this have? And clearly there was a, ma a, de a demand before um, for part-time learning and for people returning to education and what impact does it have in, on, on student experiences and, and, and trying to minimise, uh, not increase inequality in that, in that part of Scotland? Um, we've reported previously on the Scotland-wide picture and the shifts in the student body that we've seen um, as a result of government policy to focus on younger full-time students whose courses are leading to a recognised qualification. Um, and that has meant a reduction in older learners, in women learners and part-time learners. Um, now, that will have different effects in different parts of the country, as you say, depending on the demography. Um, and the college feels um, that the demography that it is serving um, means that it's had a, a disproportionate effect on their ability to meet their targets and therefore to balance their finances. As Mark said a moment ago, um, the responsibility really is between the college and the regional body to negotiate their targets with the funding council to make sure that they're achievable. And that negotiation has to take account of both what the national priorities are and the the student body that they're serving, the needs of employers in the area, all of those sorts of issues. Um, I think I think what's had an effect here is the um, late recognition of what that shift in policy and the shift in the target meant for this college. The review which has been underway should, if it's been carried out effectively, deal with that. Um, but there may well still be an impact of the national policy in this area, which means that some students who previously would have been el eligible for further education won't in future. And that's an inevitable consequence of a policy shift of that nature. Is there sufficient flexibility in the national policy to accommodate these local differences? I think the national policy has been very clear, and it's for any government to set policy of that type, and I'm specifically precluded from commenting on it. Um, the question then is how you implement it. Um, there is room within the negotiation between the funding council and the regional body um, in, in regional areas um, to have that negotiation, but there is obviously still a cap on the overall funding that's available that will feed through to the targets agreed. Thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you. I'd like to continue on the, the governance thing. I'm sorry to be sort of worrying that one. Um, in paragraph 13, there's a pretty damning statement saying there's little evidence of the board taking effective action to adjust the college's operations to address these risks. So clearly, there was an expectation on or at Scotland's part that the board would be rather more proactive in what it was doing. And then in paragraph 16, you say that seven experienced members left, including the chair. Was that a result one on, one on the other? 
Uh, the, sh the short answer to your second question is no. Um, the board, as we say in um, paragraph 13, um, was aware of the risks associated with under-delivery and put in place some changes to its marketing, its employer engagement and its curriculum strategies, but they weren't sufficient to address the scale of the challenges that it was deal dealing with. The departure of board members was a result of the um, uh, post-16 Reform Act and the fact that a number of board members had been appointed at the same time and their terms of appointment ended at the same time. Um, that's also the case in the Murray College report that you'll come to. And again, it's another effect of reform that made the whole thing more difficult, I think. Michael, do you want to add anything to that? No, no, I think from the, the work that was carried out, we didn't see a direct correlation between the two. And as I say, the, the phasing of board members' appointments is is one matter, although you can see historically that um, the board, whatever actions were taken and discussions were taken at board level, um, in hindsight, have been shown to be not effective in making sure that the college can meet its activity So they did take meet. action, but the action was inadequate. And I think looking at the historical information, as I say, from the, the work we've carried out, we can see that there was discussions at board level, there was actions taken as a result of those discussions. Um, but when you look at the figures that are shown in Exhibit 1, those actions have been shown that they haven't meant the college can achieve the, the agreed activity targets. Now, I understand from this that uh, there's 13 board members. So seven stood down, which clearly created a number of problems. And I think there was something about uh, the uh, standing committees did not meet for, from memory, a year, almost a year. But you also said there was no, no evidence that the absence of that caused any problems? No, I said that there's no evidence that the departures of the board members were a direct result of the problems that had taken place. Um, the, if you look at paragraph 17, uh, we say in here that there's no indication that the absence of meetings affected delivery targets, but obviously boards play a key role in um, the governance of FE colleges as much as any organisation and it had the board and its committees been meeting it's possible that the action they took could have been more effective. Now on paragraph 17 you say of the current 13 members six had served on the board in the years immediately prior to 2015-16 so that would be the balance of the 13 right. carrying on. Yes. Is there any sort of question mark over the continuation of members when there's clearly been uh, an indictment of them and the actions they've taken. What has the board done to reform itself? What's the board done to do a better job? Has there been retraining? Has, has not just induction, that, that's, that's a, a routine process, but has there really been training of this board? Because clearly a good chunk of the members that are still there failed in their duty before. How do we know they're not going to fail in their duty going forward? I'll ask Michael in a moment if he can give you more information about um, other forms of board development or action that's been taken. I think the continuation of the six members um, is a, a natural result of the desire not to lose all of the experience of the college that, that is already in place on the board, given that seven had departed during this period, albeit one was reappointed. Um, there is a question, I think, for the college, for UHI and potentially for the Funding Council about um, whether more is required to help board members understand and carry out their roles effectively. But I think it's not, uh, not surprising that six members continued, given the need for some continuity in understanding and this. Given the size of this college, 13 seems quite a large board. And we have discussed, I think, with this committee previously, the variation in the size and composition of boards and the fact that some of them to us look very large for the role that they're, carried, that they're asked to carry out. I would agree with you that 13 looks like a large number here. Um, there are requirements for um, staff and student representation, for example, employer representation, um, but I think a balance has to be struck between uh, hearing the voices of stakeholders and having a board that's small enough to carry out its governance role effectively. So back to what's been done to make sure this board's going to be effective in the future. Michael, anything you can add to what we say in the reports? Yeah, it's difficult for us to comment because the, the audit cycle has now moved on and, and my firm is no longer the appointed auditor. So we, we don't have sight on the, the ongoing training and development of the board. Um, a lot of the movement happened around about the year end, so just at the end of our appointment process. And we flagged up that in our annual report that inductions hadn't even taken place for some of these board members. And we can see that as updated in the Auditor General's report, though that induction process has now taken place, so there is some development going on. Um, my understanding is UHI 
as a whole um, is involved in the kind of ongoing induction and ongoing training development of board members, and that, that takes place potentially on the mainland. Um, and Lewis Castle College may have some difficulties in getting the, the cost in relation to getting board members over for training that it has to work out with its regional body and, and its partners. Um, so it's hard to talk about specific ongoing development for the board members in, in that mm. case. Um, I would flag up also that I think given that the activity targets now look like they will fall for Lewis Castle College, it, it may be that you, you may infer from that that the, the performance, the underperformance in 1516, um, it's potentially not, not misleading, but it's overstated because if the actual activity targets have been found to be too high, albeit potentially they could still underperform, they may not have underperformed to that level, if that makes sense. Or right, John, given all the comment on boards and uh, issues around their effectiveness and so on, in future uh, um, audits, would you consider whether to comment more strongly on the effectiveness of boards? In the case of Edinburgh College, they were almost invisible until the latter stages there. Um, Michael referred then to the new audit appointments which came into effect in November of last year for the next five years. Those new appointments are accompanied by a new code of audit practice, um, which strengthens the expectations that I place on the auditors that I appoint to comment <coughs> on the wider dimensions of public audit, and one of those is governance. The audit always covered those wider dimensions, but often what we were seeing was a description of the governance arrangements rather than a conclusion about their effectiveness. So I hope that the code of audit practice will um, support more clarity in the auditor's work about whether the governance arrangements are effective or not, and that will obviously provide a firm basis for me to report to this committee about them. Okay. Thank you. 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 So we went in over to Lewes and the Western Isles here, and uh, we've been a wee bit harsh. The measurement criteria we use here, we're saying things like the college has persistently failed to meet its targets. But it's, it's a small college, and it's hard to see, you know, if, if the main problem is losing young people from the islands, it's kind of hard to see how they can can meet this these targets. So is there a is there a case to be to, to be made that the the way we measure all of the colleges? is a bit unfair when it comes to a college like, like Lewes. Uh, and my other question is, like, are, are young people leaving the island to, because the, the, co the college courses are just not there for them? Are they choosing to go to Inverness and beyond? Is there a reason there behind that? Um, so I think maybe there's a case convener to say, are, are we looking fairly at Lewes and by judging it in terms of Edinburgh? and we're applying the same judgment criteria to lose? I think it's a very fair question to ask. Um, obviously, the college <coughs> is accountable for the funding it receives, and that funding is linked to activity targets agreed with the funding council. Um, and I think there, there is a, a challenge in that um, all of that changed very quickly, and both the college and the new regional body didn't fully understand the implications. Um, and I think we are hopeful that the revised targets that have been agreed will, will help to make that adjustment. There's obviously a much bigger question about how, how we do meet the learning needs of young people and other learners in remote parts of Scotland, and particularly the islands. And I think that was a big driver for the establishment of UHI as the regional body for FE, to be able to join up the provision in the individual colleges among themselves and between the colleges and the university to help to get um, better planned provision and better journeys for learners uh, to, to build their qualifications and their experience within their local area. Um, it's too early, I think, to, to see that um, working yet because the, the UHI is still in the process of agreeing revised targets with the funding with the FE colleges locally. Um, but I think it is well worth keeping an eye on how that's developing, and it's certainly something we'll be looking at through our audit work. It may also be something the committee is interested in, given the particular issues in that part of Scotland. Absolutely, and just a minor technical query. And page six, I think it was referred to in the table. I mean, what's the correlation between the weighted sum totals and the credit totals? I mean, you can see that it's dropped. The weighted sum tally was 9,000, and it's now down to 6,000 in terms of credits. Is that a direct correlation, or is there...? 
We, the we try to explain it in footnote three on page seven, but I'll ask Mark <laughs> for the benefit of the, re the report to give you a quick summary of I'm of just what interested the in the fact that yeah. if something's been revised yeah. down to try and accommodate... They are related, but they're measuring the same thing in a different way. Right. Mark can talk you through how it works. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, the main difference is that previously there were a number of factors and weightings included in the application of the, the weighted sums uh, units, and that's now been removed to... Um, as far as the SFC is concerned, to simplify the model in a way and to categorise things under f five separate categories. There are still weightings for things like rurality, but they don't have as much, uh, they don't bear as much on the, the overall figure. Our understanding is that the, the credits target, um, while being broadly comparable to W sums, won't ultimately be exactly the same as it. Um, partly be, and, and partly that's why they've offered a degree of protection for a number of years of no college being any worse off than more than 1% um, uh, over the period. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions on Lewes Castle College, we'll move to Murray College. Um, and can I invite contributions from members who would like to go first? Liam Kerr. Great. <clears throat> so the uh, Murray College, uh, I'm interested in the staffing again. Uh, it would appear that the staff costs are unsustainable going forward. Uh, and appear to be rather high, or certainly higher than the average across the rest of the, the, the country. Do you have any oversight, historically, why that is? Is that because the staff that are there are being overpaid, uh, or is it because they're overstaffed? And is there anything that you can, um, any insight you can offer into the staffing costs at the college? Yes. Um, in terms of the um, the numbers that are currently recorded, that's um, there's been no change in the college numbers um, through reclassification of colleges. So that's a different position from other colleges. Um, others have been involved in um, as a way of making efficiencies. They've been looking at the service that they're providing and they've been streamlining activities. Money so far have not felt they needed to do any of that. So as a result of that, their current figures are looking higher compared to other colleges. Which, which leads to the conclusion that there will be staff losses coming down the line. Uh, and I notice that there's uh, reference to a, a voluntary severance scheme that's in the planning. Where are we on that? Um, You'll see in the report that we make reference to um, a recovery plan mm -hmm. and a significant element of the recovery plan is the assumption that a severance scheme will go ahead. Um, that's currently, um, that's been approved by the College Board and it's been submitted to UHI and SFC. So it's currently with them for approval. Um, the, the delivery of the severance scheme will be dependent on funding coming forward from SFC through UHI. Um, and my understanding is that initially that will focus on looking at trying to review the um, support, the support staff and back office activities. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, this, um, th this really concerns me because whenever we do one of these schemes, this is, this is real people. This is people's jobs. Um, and it's also the student experience. Monica Lennon mentioned that earlier on. And, uh, I always have a concern that, at the end of the day, management made decisions to recruit, management made decisions to hold the estate as it is, and now you talk about the support staff in the in the first tranche, if I can put it that way, paying paying the price, and the students paying the price. Uh, presumably, that's factored into these discussions to the, to the recovery plan. Is that correct? Are people having an oversight of those sorts of issues? At this at this stage, my um my understanding is that the, um, the the scheme is being put in place as part of the recovery plan. Um, I don't think it's at an advanced enough stage um, to you know to mm -hmm. understand where they are in terms of the detail and how that's been taken forward. Right. I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Kerr, that voluntary severance schemes always do affect um, both the services being provided and the lives of the people who who lose their jobs or move on as a result of that, um, and that has affected 
FE colleges across Scotland, given the significant reduction in funding we've seen over the last few years. I think our concern is this, in this case, as Anna said, is the delay in um, getting to grips with what the change in the funding model and the change in demand for courses means for this college, which limits the, the possibility of doing that in a more strategic and more managed way. And as I think you're hinting, there's always a risk that suboptimal decisions need to be made to balance the books because the opportunity to, to take a wider look and to do it over a longer period has been missed. And, and just, uh, Colin Beatty's made the point a few times about the governance, and, and you mentioned there that, that there has been, or there may have been a failure to get to grips with new guidance and things. Is this another example of uh, management being challenged and not perhaps getting a, a full feel for what they have to do? I think what we're seeing in this case is slightly different. different. I think what we're seeing is a failure of financial management, um, which at the highest level manifests itself in the need to ask for effectively emergency funding from UHI in 2014-15 and again in 2015-16, simply in, able to, in order to be able to pay their bills, to meet their financial obligations. That shouldn't happen in a public body. Public bodies should have a, a good enough understanding of their financial flows um, to avoid that sort of emergency action being needed. Needed. We describe in the report um, some of the things that made up the need for the cash advance in 2015-16 in, in paragraph 10, um, and some of those are things which, again, you would expect um, a, a, a finance function which was staffed with people of the right experience and calibre um, to be able to see coming and to recognise. And I think my view is that if you have a finance function that doesn't have the capacity to manage at that day-to-day -day level, it's unlikely they're going to be able to um, either themselves or support the board to be taking that longer term view. Um, we also say in the report that the um, information that was going to the board didn't, for, for those same reasons, didn't give them the emerging picture as it was coming forward. So the only option was to ask for an, an emergency advance on funding rather than to have a longer term view. So I think it's a slightly different issue about the capacity of the finance function in this college. And does that explain, just so I'm absolutely clear, because you've talked about, uh, or I found it very surprising that the college forecast end of year surplus 145,000 and then three months later it was a half million pound deficit uh, and that's a capacity issue that was just the circumstances prevailing at the time was it? Exactly right. I think it's not having a full understanding of what the real financial position looks like and not reporting that to the board so that they can fulfil their responsibilities as a result. I understand. Uh, one final question is just around, the, you mentioned the recovery plan uh, in, in one of the earlier answers, uh, and part of the recovery plan is increasing income generation. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, is that actually feasible? Can they really increase income generation from other sources to such a level as to form part of the recovery? Um, the College have been looking at um, a number of options to try and introduce some new courses um, that would try and link in more with the actual area of Murray, so for example round about Whiskey um, as an example. So they do feel that they have two or three viable examples but obviously that's not going to happen overnight and they need a bit of time to develop those. I understand. Thank you. Good. Colin Beatty. Thank you. Back to governance. Um, firstly, can I just clarify, is the existing board still in place? At the, the existing board at the time of the audit? Um, there was a, a refresh of the board in August last year. So there's about four, four people have continued from the previous board into the new board. How large is the board? 18 people. 18? One eight. One eight. So out of 18 board members, only four are continuing? Correct. Is that a concern in terms of experience? And It is, of course. I said earlier, I think there's always a balance to be struck between refreshing a board for whatever reason and keeping continuity. Again, I think the underlying um, reason for that degree of turnover was the post-16 Education Act and the implications of a number of appointments being made at the same point without thinking through that um, turnover question. I mean... I have a huge concern here that, for example, in paragraph 8, uh, the board and committee minutes did not evidence decisions or agreed actions to address the college's financial challenges. I mean, it's pretty basic that you record the decisions you take in the minutes, but you're saying that that didn't happen. Um, it, it didn't happen. Anne reported that in her 2014-15 audit report, so a couple of years ago now. And, of course, the steps that were taken in the same paragraph, you say they were not sufficient. So... Yes. 
whatever the board approved, and you can't be sure, wasn't enough. And it says, it, again, it says that uh, the, audit, the audit highlighted lack of financial expertise and so forth. Presumably those audit reports went to the board and the board did anything. And do you want to comment on the receipt? Okay, thank you. Um, over the course of 14, 15 and 15, 16, um, there were certainly a lot of financial challenges faced by the college. Um, as we've said earlier, it was it's a small college, a small finance team. So we're talking about five people in total. Um, that's five full-time equivalents. I think we're talking maybe about eight people um, in, in terms of numbers on seats. Um, so over the course of most of this period, the Director of Finance was absent through long-term sickness. Um, so this definitely put um, pressure on, on the rest of the team. Um, so it was... Um, it, the, so there was, uh, and there was, there was changes in the staff as well. So there was quite a new, in terms of the, the main accountant who was there during this process, um, she came in. But the board would have been aware of this. Yes, absolutely. And the, what action did they take? Um, the, the main, the main problem in fourteen fifteen um, was round about the um, assumptions associated with the HE numbers, and therefore the funding that they were going to get from that. Um, and that had been the main the main issue that led to the cash advance in fourteen fifteen. That wasn't an issue in fifteen sixteen. So I think to a certain extent the board felt that they they were getting better information and they were understanding more um, the the context round about the financial figures. Did they know they weren't getting good information or adequate information? They must have. They must have done. Yes. And yes. They took no action. Well, on, on the back of our recommendations, there, there was improved information during 15-16 in terms of there was a much improved narrative round about the figures and the differences between budget and variances. But what they were still failing to do was to explain the swings. So in, in the report, we were talking about the significant swings. It failed to explain those fully as to why those had arisen and why they couldn't be um, been seen in advance. So they're still looking at what the board were seeing. Um, the report states there was a lack of audit trails to support some of the figures included in the management accounts. Now, there's two things here. Firstly, were the board getting incorrect or, or, or inadequate figures? And secondly, for these audit trails, what about internal audit? What were they doing about that? Um, the board were getting the best information that finance felt that they had at that point in time, bearing in mind the... Um, the, the issues I've already mentioned round about capacity. Um, but if there's a lack of audit trail to prove these figures... What I'm referring to there in terms of the audit trail is the lack of narrative supporting figures. So the board were getting a statement with figures explaining you know, the actual against budget but was failing to explain the movements adequately. So that's what I mean by audit trails in Which this respect. Pretty basic stuff. Yes. Now, if there was, a, if there was a, in, inadequate audit trails, what about internal audit? Um... Internal audit. Who's um, responsible for the for the audit trails? Ultimately, that would be finance. But internal audit must have a role in there someplace. Um, and the program that's carried out by internal audit, internal audit in this case is outsourced to a firm. It's not an in-house internal audit function. Um, so a program of work is agreed with with the audit committee at the beginning of the year. So that will be directed. You know, so so that will determine what um, internal audit are going to look at. So they wouldn't pick this up. They wouldn't pick up these sort of inadequacies. That wasn't part of the schedule that they looked at this year. I think we've been through this before, Auditor General, with uh, internal audit and uh, the fact that they are so restricted in what they do by the contract that they have. As long as they tick the boxes, everything's fine. There's, there's sort of no intelligent overall looking at these things, and I think that's a huge gap, and it, that gap's come out here. I, I think that, for me, the issue is a slightly different one. If you look at paragraph 12 of the report, um, you, it talks about the overall senior management of the college. Um, between April 2015 and February 2016, the college didn't have a permanent principal. The director of finance was on long-term sick leave. The acting principal took on the director of finance role. Um, and then uh, there were problems within the overall audit team, all of which were flagged by Anna as the auditor to the board. For me, that's the bigger question. That in 
long-term audit can't compensate for that lack of capacity and lack of strength within the senior management who are uh, responsible to providing for providing the board with the information it needs to but carry out its responsibilities. what we're saying is that the board didn't take the action that was required of them. And, and the report says, says that very clearly. Now, only four of the original board are there, mm -hmm. 18 on this board. Again, it comes back to what sort of training are they getting? And I think we so have, this doesn't happen again. I think we're likely to have the same issues that Mark highlighted in relation to Lewes Castle, um, that the University of the Highlands and Islands does provide induction training and the Funding Council provides support to board members. Um, there, I don't know the answer as to how many of the boards have been through the induction training and other training, but it often is more difficult to provide it in a way that's readily accessible mm. to board members in remote areas. And it's something that I think the new auditor will be following up as part of the audit work for 2016-17 when that gets underway. It certainly raises a lot of questions about the boards and the actions of the boards and the, the, the understanding of the boards as to what the responsibilities are and what they should be doing. Yes. Um, thank you, convener. Um, in terms of the, of the current board, although my audit appointment has now, has now concluded, um, in terms of my experience with the new board from August through to Christmas, I would, I would certainly confirm that there's been increased finance and business expertise on the committee. Um, also, one of the um, new initiatives over the course of the last year or so in the sector is the Code of Good Governance, and a significant element of that is round about the effectiveness of a board. And um, as a result, as soon as so, they delayed implementing or looking at s certain aspects of the code until the new board was in place. And so since the new boards come in, they've done a full review of looking at their skills, looking at um, what's happened over the last year or two in the absence of the director of finance and um, the change in principles. And I was, I was assured that I certainly had a lot of comfort that the new board was totally on top of the current issues and were, would be taking action appropriately. Well, let's hope it is. Okay. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Um, my attention is drawn to paragraph 10 in the, your report to Auditor General about the cash advance and so on, but there's a couple of items in there that are of particular interest. For example, the funding clawback mentioned of £79,000 through the ERDF project, and then there's another one just below that, a delay in releasing European structural funds. Is there, is there an issue in the College about managing the European bids and projects? And, why would that expertise, advice, guidance not be available from the kind of UHI level at the top? It's a bit concerning. Yeah, um, in terms of the European funding, um, this was um, part funding to um, for the construction of a new building as part of the college, the Alexander Graham Bell building. Um, and ERDF funding comes with a lot of um, conditions mm -hmm. in terms of the information that's kept um, and how the funding is used. Um, and it's often the case that e European Union European Union auditors will come and review projects, and that was the case in this occasion. So, um, separate from the audit that we do, there was an audit undertaken of the project by the European Union um, auditors, and um, there was there was problems with the, the again the audit trails and the paperwork that was retained, because it was a significant project for the for the college. They appointed um, external project managers, and I think there was kind of. Um, it was unclear from the outset as to who was going to be responsible for the record keeping um, and ensuring that all the audit trails were there for a sufficient period there afterwards. So they were able to bring most of it together, but there were some gaps, and as a result of that, there was a clawback. So the clawback, as mentioned, is 79,000, just to give you, um, put that into scale. The overall project was 6.5 million, of which 2.6 million was ERDF funding. So the clawback is 79,000 out of 2.6 million. Okay, okay, that puts it in a bit more context. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, if there are no other questions from members of the committee, can I thank the witnesses for their evidence this morning and now move us into private session.